Uh, welcome to this edition of Eamon and the Gaffers. Uh, the gaffer you're going to meet in this episode is the trendiest gaffer in the whole of football. You're going to find out lots, lots more about him. As I tell you, it is Gareth Ainsworth, uh, Wickham Wanderers manager. Uh, Gareth joined Wickham as a player 10 years ago. He was named in the PFA League Two Team of the Year in 2010-11 as Wickham won promotion out of that division. He was appointed the club's manager in November 2012 after a short period as caretaker manager and he retired from regular playing to concentrate on management duties seven years ago. He led the club to promotion from League Two at the end of the 2017-18 season and then from League One in 2020 securing a place in the championship for the first time in the club's history. Gareth, how does that feel, the championship? <laughs> it's, it, still feels, it still feels weird, I mean, you know, it, it really does. Uh, seeing the Wickham Wanderers badge, we were, we were in yesterday at the training ground and seeing that Wickham Wanderers badge, the, the blue badge with the white swan on it, amongst all these famous, famous clubs with so much history, it's just... Still pinch yourself time, and uh, and we're really we're really proud of what we've achieved. And again, once again, the boys have been fantastic this season. And what a way to do it! And uh, yeah, we've got a big challenge ahead, but we're enjoying it. Big challenge up in the big leagues with the bigger boys. Um, and I suppose you say, right, great championship job done. And then you think, oh, what what is ahead? So you know, as a manager, close season. You got to look at your squad. You got to look at the depth you have. You got to. There's obviously new challenges for you with the new league. Yeah, totally. You know, um, it's going to be it's it's going to be a, a challenge, like you say. I mean, uh, what I did say though, when we came back from from lockdown, and I know we'll probably go into a little bit of this, but I told the boys that we've all watched the championship when we knew we were in these playoffs, and all thought we can do that. So. That was part of my mantra of saying to the boys, you, you can do that and it's your turn to show you can do that. So I'm not going to wholesale change everything. The, these boys who've got me up, they're going to get a chance to play in the, in the championship. So it's not going to be wholesale, big upside down changes. It's going to be a few additions of, of quality, maybe take a few that I released who, who just didn't make the grade enough or didn't get in the team enough and probably put the next four on the top. So it just raises the whole levels and uh and so it's not going to be a big change. What we what we've got at Wickham is really special, and the people who are coming in have got to join that rather than trying to change everything. Um, yeah, really special. I'm talking about big changes. I mean, you start off great in terms of the fixtures. You get a home game to kick off uh, in the championship. You're you're playing against Rotherham, but without supporters. That's I mean, this pandemic thing. You know, it comes along. You've you know, how different is it? And, and what about your supporters? What should they expect in terms of change? I mean, you're in the championship, but, you know, things have changed. Resources have changed. Um, the availability of players have changed. Bank balances have changed. What, what would you say to the supporters in terms of expectation? Yeah, I, I think they're a realistic bunch down at Wickham. You know, I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's probably my board that I need to to change their expectations more than anything now. I'm only joking. They've been great. And, and I think they all know that if if Wickham's in the championship in 21-22, then it'll be an extraordinary achievement, bigger than probably getting there. But um, we we have got this momentum. We have got this this uh, this spirit. And uh, and there's been teams in the history, you know, your you Bournemouth, your Sheffield United, who, who have used that momentum to keep going and keep pushing. And, and I intend to I intend to keep this momentum going, and uh, and we've got like you say Rotherham in that first game. It's a team that came up with us, um, and and again probably fancied to, to come down with us as well. So it may not be your your Forest or your or your Middlesbrough, or your big your Blackburn or a big team up there. So it might be a nice introduction to the championship. But um, I've looked at the fixtures that came out. I mean, <laughs> there's a few tough ones after that, believe me. So. Um, uh, looking forward to it, but again, expectation for the fans. I I'm gutted they're not going to be there for these first few games because it's championship. It's all they've ever dreamed of, and they can't walk through the door. But hopefully that will change soon. But expectation wise, I think uh, I think the fans have got my back, and uh, and they know that if we get beat, it won't be through a lack of effort. It won't be through a lack of preparation. It'll be because there's some good good teams in that league. 
For anybody who's never been to Wickham and been to your ground and know the supporters, what's Wickham like as a town? What are the fans like? What is this club like? What does this club stand for? I, I know of Wickham through Martin O'Neill, having been there for, for five years. Yeah, of course. I mean, Martin did phenomenal things for this club. You know, he got, he got it from the non-league into the league, which, again, what an achievement. Um, but it's always been, I think, Wickham, historically, has always been that club that were a non-league club and is seen as a non-league club. We've only been in the league 20-odd 20, 20 years, 28 years, I think. So by the time Wickham got in the league, everyone around the Wickham area had a team. They had a QPR, they had a, a Brentford, they had a, a whoever it was. And... And you know yourself, once you get your team, you don't change. You know, you don't change just because the local team gets in the league. You don't suddenly go, right, that's me finish with you and I'm on this team now. So we got to build the fan base up and Martin did a brilliant job. And, and the real the real generation thing, we've had to stay in the league a couple of generations to get this next bunch of fans coming through who want to support Wickham. And because you know what it's like, your, your dad will tell you who to support because he supported them and, that, yeah. and that's the thing then. And, so we're trying to get these these ten year olds and get them into Wickham and get them the shirts at school. So we're slowly, slowly doing that. I actually saw last season when when the fans were allowed in, um, I saw a bunch of twenty eighteen to twenty year olds, about thirty of them. And I know these can be the uh, the, the, the troublemakers sometimes, but it was great to see because we've never had that. It's always been historically the older people, the the Wickham stalwarts have always been there. We seem to get this new this new bunch now, this new proud bunch that want to support Wickham Wanderers. So the town itself, um, it's, it's not been a football town historically, but it's changing now with championship. I had a, letter, I had a lovely letter from the council um, a couple of weeks ago just saying, thank you for what you've done for the town. And that, that was wow. amazing to, to, to get that letter because that's, uh, it means so much. It's away fans coming, football, Wickham Wanderers on the map. People will be saying, where, where actually is Wickham? And they'll find out, and uh, and hopefully they'll they'll find out it's not too an easy a place to come either. <laughs> That's good. And do you know that business about fans? I totally agree with you. I mean, it is right as a parent you tell your children who to support. That is, they should support the same team as you. I had a couple of uh, episodes where I, I basically, um, when my children were younger, um, there was adoption mentioned to them if um, if they didn't do what they were supposed to do, but they did the right thing. They saw the right thing to do at the end of the day. And the most lovely feeling, I have to say, Gareth, is all my brothers support Man United. I have four other brothers. All my, all my kids have four kids. They're all United mad. I could not imagine what it would be like in, in the house, if one supported Chelsea, one supported Arsenal, one supported Liverpool, I just couldn't. It's like a religion. It is yeah. like an absolute religion and a faith. And do you know what with kids? Do, do you have kids, Gareth? I do, yeah. So two girls and a boy, yeah. So. yeah. Did you know what? You won't have, we'll, we'll talk about this shortly, you mightn't have music in common with them. You, you probably don't have politics in common with them. You yeah. mightn't have fashion in common with them, though you look a very trendy dad to me. But uh, the thing is, if you can have football in common with your kids, it's the most marvellous thing. It's the most yeah, incredible thing. Totally agree. Totally agree. I, I've got um, the, the, the girls. I mean, the girls are sporty, but football really, like you say, the boys and my 13-year-old boy, Kane, he, he, uh, he's actually, I'm a Blackburn fan. Um, I was born and bred in Blackburn and that's where I grew up. And, I, and as he, as, when he was born, I wanted to put the Blackburn stuff onto him a little bit. But um, we lived down south. I played for QPR. He was born in a hospital close to QPR. He's chosen to be a QPR fan, which I can take because I play for QPR, so I'm not too yeah. concerned yeah. about it. But, yeah. uh, but again, he's, 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 he's going to be QPR now, and I can't change him. Obviously, he supports Wickham when we're playing, but he says, Dad, that's my team, QPR. And, uh, and so, like you say, it's, it's in them. They, they can't change, and we're trying to change just this, this generation's now of Wickham people coming up going, yes, wonders. and if we can do well in the championship, we'll go a long way to that. Now, we're going to go back generations. We're going to talk about um, you. Gareth, as he alluded to there, he was born in Blackburn. Uh, Blackburn. Uh, his mother worked as a professional singer during the 60s, as I understand it. And your father worked in several different jobs, including a bookmaker, a driving instructor, and a factory clerk. Uh, both his parents were avid music fans, and his mother taught Gareth to, wait for it, sing as a child. And I immediately thought, 
did she teach you to sing in a choir? Did she sing, was it classical music? Did she play the piano when you sang alongside her? What sort of singing was this that mum introduced you to? Yeah, so um, it, it was it was the choir, the choir singing. Um, she would uh, she would sing in church on a Sunday, um, and but she growing up. I mean, going back, growing up, she was. She, that's where they met. My my dad was a groupie. My my mum was a professional singer, and, and that's how they met. So uh, music was always in the house, always in the house. Dusty Springfield, Brenda Lee, oh. you know, some some real. Um, amazing, amazing vocalist, Janis Joplin, people like that in the house, female vocalist, it was amazing. And my dad was a rocker, so my dad was Hendrix, the, the Who, you know, and 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 so I was, I, I still look back thinking, I was so lucky to have that, because my kids, like you alluded to earlier, I don't know what the heck's going on sometimes in their rooms, so I can't even understand the music. So very lucky to have that, but mum was a, was a singer and she wanted to, I think she wanted to carry that on through, she was so proud of that, she loved the singing and <clears throat> and it was the breathing exercise then. So we, we, we'd sing along to songs and she'd stop sometimes and say, right, you've got to get your breath from, from here. You've got, and, and little things like this that when you learn as a child, you don't forget. So, you know, she was brilliant at that. And then we'd go, um, we ch we uh, church goes on a Sunday and she'd sing with the choir. And then I'd end up singing with the choir, singing with the choir at school. And um, my only big regret is never learning a, an instrument properly. I, I can, strum along rhythm guitar um as as well as probably you <laughs> but um i'm not i'm not professing to be a but, slight but, but it's interesting more. hearing your story there and it sounds very idyllic very straightforward very in many ways uh, conservative um classical however um during during your playing days and uh, you then took that singing skill and you picked up the nickname wild thing right because you had rock star ambitions so then tell me what what happened where did you i mean and like and i can tell from your from your look there and whatever that's that's that would be a rock tribute would it your your hair oh, that, that yeah oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. oh Absolutely. yeah so tell me where it all went rock for you um it all went rock right this is this is the the story it went rock when about the mid 80s um, I, I was learning to drive. I, I, I got my first car, uh, and it was the old cassette players. And 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 uh, the first, I mean, I, I was I was loving the the eighties hair bear, but uh, Bon Jovi's and Poison, and 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 then Guns and Roses, Motley Crue. They were all there, and I was all my friends started getting into this new dance stuff that was coming out. But I always stayed true to the to the rock, and and that. But the big moment I always remember was that I, I passed my test learning to drive mid to late eighties. And my dad gave me a, a cassette, obviously cassette players in those days. And it was the story of the who, and it's the only cassette I had. And I put it in and I listened to that. And, I, and you know, when you learn to drive, you're out in your cars, you're always out. You can't stop driving. You're loving driving. And I played that back to back, back to back, back to back. And it was just, it was just instilled in me, just the, the rocker star. And I just wanted to be true to that. I wanted to stay to that. My mum was a singer. I wanted to stay true to the rock, rock and roll. And, uh, and that's, where it, that's where it came from, I think. So were there any more ambitions rock and roll wise outside uh, just playing around at it? Was, were there any ambitions? Did it ever conflict with football that you thought that, that this instead of football or maybe after football, this would be me full time in the music industry? Yeah, I, I, did, I did have visions. I had, I had ambitions of, of singing in a band. I used to have dreams of singing on, on, on a stage at a young age and, and being in a rock band. That, that's what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I was really, um, I remember the, the careers people coming around at school and I was good at football by this time. I was, I was shining at football. Um, and not conforming has always been sort of something where I don't, I don't, I don't ever want to shock people and do stupid things, but I always question why you just have to go the norm all the time. So the careers people come around saying, what jobs are you looking at? And I thought to myself, I want, I want to either be a singer or a footballer. And if I say this to these people, they're just going to, they're going to just laugh at me. But so I kept the singer secret and I said to them, I want to be a professional footballer. And they still, they still laughed at me. I said, oh, that's only for the really talented. What about, what about this subject and that subject? And, uh, and so the, the singing was the ambition. The football sort of took over and, and, and snowballed and avalanched. And, and you know, it, 
I'm so lucky to be where I am and uh, and work really hard for it. But um, the singing was always probably in there, um, and it's always a, not a regret, but a what if, what if it's always in there, you know. And uh, I've often been asked if it's David Beckham's life or Mick Jagger's life, then uh, I'll tell you what, I'd be I'd be Mick Jagger, hundred times out of a hundred. Yeah. And, and do you do you still sing? Yeah, yeah, I still sing. So we have a band, um, the Cold Blooded Hearts. Uh, we released. Uh, the Wanderer, which uh, obviously a cover song just before by Dion, just before Christmas. Uh, Is that the Wanderer? Like I'm a kind of guy who yeah. well, I'm a wanderer. Yeah. I'm a wanderer. You could have done back Yeah. Oh yes. I, I know all the music. I don't know any of the words. That's me. You're <laughs> stealing all my thunder there, Evan. Yeah. Sorry, you know, that, is a, that is the song. Can we release that. Well, just... you're a bit like status quo then. Um, I, I wouldn't say we're like status quo. This was more of a more of a gimmick than anything because it was the Wanderer that the American yeah. from over. They they love their music as well over there. New Orleans, the, the New Orleans. So obviously, um, you go down New Orleans. There's music in every every bar. So they wanted me to to release this, and um, and yeah, we uh, we did a recording of it, released it out. But my true love is uh, is is classic rock. You know, my my The Doors and probably my favourites and. The, the, the look he's modelled on Morrison, probably. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's something oh, brilliant, in brilliant. Something right, Well, let's try that Wanderer thing. Right, so you'll know the words, right? And I'll okay. sing along with you. Right, so off you go. You need to join in the chorus. Okay? Oh, yeah, I've got, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm with you the whole way. I'm with you the whole way. Okay, well, I'm the type of guy who will never settle down. Settle down. Pretty girls are, well, you know I'm around. I hug them and I kiss them, because to me they're all the same. I love them and I squeeze them, they don't even know my name, they call Cause it. Cause I'm a wanderer, oh yeah. I'm a wanderer, and I go round and round and round and round and da da da, -da. <laughs> Look at that, look at that, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, that's super, I can see the joy that give you, gives you, um, and you say, you know, either Mick Jagger or David Beckham, you chose the David Beckham route. And funny, yeah. you were a very good crosser of the ball, you were always noted uh, as being a good crosser of the ball. Is that something that you have instilled in Wickham? Do you still believe in that philosophy of using the wings, for instance? Uh, yeah, and I think it's something really, really well brought up because it seems to have gone out of the game, you know, and, and uh, the ability to cross the ball, I think, is, is an art, you know, and, and you mentioned Beckham. Uh, he, 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 I played with him at Preston North End and he was, he was a super player then. And uh, But crossing the ball is an art still. It's not just... It's not just sticking a ball in a box, you know, and I think that uh, at Wickham, we still try and deliver. We have the big man up front, obviously, Akin Fenwa, who uh, is, is an absolute diamond in the box. You know, you can get any ball around or near him, he'll make the best of it. And, uh, and so we, we don't refuse crosses at Wickham, you know, if we're getting crossing opportunities. I'm still a big believer in, in the fans love seeing crosses coming into the box. They love forward play. They, and I know that there's this... There's this game evolved now, and this purest game, and it's fantastically possession-based football and some great skills and some great moves. But I still think there's a place for, for getting that ball forward, getting that ball in the box, and uh, and almost old-fashioned a little bit. But um, it's great to see, and uh, and I love I love the uh, the. That's ability. the entertain the entertainer in you. We're talking about um, okay. singing, performing. And therefore, as a player and a manager, it's obviously that there is a uh, hunger, a thirst, uh, an ethic that, that says this is the entertainment business as well. Maybe, yeah, giving the fans what they want or what you think they want, you know. And I think that, like you say, the action, uh, I, I've always I, I buzz off the action and the, uh, and the being on the edge of that, right? At Wickham, you know, we, we, we know and everyone knows what we do. We, we, we can't afford the greatest players in the world to keep the ball and play these fantastic moves. So what can we do? I can work hard on the opposition, find out what they do, try and destroy that and then counter and go forward with the ball. And I think, I think you're right. You know, the action, the all action tag I've got spills out onto my management in the pitch as well. And uh, yeah, I love, uh, I love seeing the boys when they're going forward and things come off. Let's go back to your early uh, playing career when you'd made that decision, you wanted to be a footballer. And um, you, you mentioned you were a, Blackburn Rovers supporter from Blackburn. Um, and you started your trainee with your, your, uh, your footballing life as a trainee with Blackburn, who were then in the second division. Uh, Don Mackay, the, the manager there, big, yeah. 
and um, okay, you think it's going well. It's your 18th birthday. Your 18th birthday. You're called into the manager's office. Tell us more. Yeah, right. And, and exactly on the day, I mean, you know, because obviously the end of the season is May, the start of May. Uh, my birthday is the 10th of May. And, uh, and so a week after the season is usually the time when you get told whether you're getting the contracts or not. And I've done two good years at Blackburn. Blackburn fans, season ticket holders since I was six years old, still have, still have the kits I used to wear. And, uh, and, and, a, and a side called the Riverside. And, and since Jack Walker came in and all the money exploded, I was there in the, in the days before that and, and loved it. Um, and Don McKay yeah, pulled me in the office uh, on my 18th birthday and I had a big night planned and everything. And, and um, he just said, Gareth, uh, we're not going to offer you a contract. And it absolutely ripped the heart out of me honestly it was it was one of the worst days the worst moments of my life because uh it was that club was everything to me football was everything to me um and i'd done well i'd done well i thought i'd done enough to, to get a contract and uh and there was seven of us um in my year of apprenticeship as it was then yts and four four got a contract um and three of us didn't and i remember holding it together walking out of his office Holding it together because I'm at a football ground. You've got to be, you, you can't be crying at a football ground. But believe me, held it together. Went in the changing room, said to the boys, "No, I'm not getting a contract." Walked straight out of the changing room into the car park, burst into tears. And I remember it to this day, and uh, and burst into tears. You know, there's no mobile phones, then there's no ringing home telling them what happened. So um, yeah, real, real tough day. But looking back, a real resilience builder as well. You know, and uh, I think. Um, it's important you go through these moments to, to make the person you are. And the manager you are and the gaffer you are, and you're now in Mackay's position where maybe you've got to do the same thing, hopefully not on somebody's birthday. But what did you learn from that? What did you take away from that whole experience and, and has it affected you as a gaffer? Yeah, um, it definitely has. Uh, I, I thought... Maybe back then there was a, there was a decision made without much explanation to me. It was on my birthday, which again maybe could have been looked at and and, and avoided. But um, I will I'll definitely look more into my players and I'll I'll, I'll look deeper into them and have more of a chat with them. And and um, what, one of my biggest strengths, I mean, I'd say people say to me as as a manager, what is your biggest strength? My my one word is probably a word that a lot of managers wouldn't use that that, that someone may say tactics or. I see this, so I said, mine's talking, mine's talking, talking to my players. I'll never shy away from a conversation. And the biggest conversations you have to have sometimes are the injured players and the players who aren't playing. They're the biggest, they're the most important sometimes because the ones who are playing, they're all good. But it's easy to go and talk to them because it's a great feeling. You've picked them, they're doing well, everyone feels good. That player who walks past you in the corridor who's been out for three months, that's an important one to talk to. You must talk to him. You must make him feel like he's part of the team because he's going to be sometime. And then, so on this last day when I'm talking to players, I make sure we, we talk and we talk and we talk. And it's not, let's get this meeting over as quick as we can. It will take as long as it takes to tell this boy why, why he's not being picked for this, this team and why, why he's not getting a contract and what we can do going forward. And, and yeah, go and prove me wrong. It's only an opinion. I did it. I, I proved someone's opinion wrong. Um, and it, that's all it is. And that's all it'll ever be. So talking, I think, is really important in football, in life, but, um, but especially in football. It's very interesting talking mm -hmm. to you now. And, you know, I've talked, I've met, I've been with a lot of football managers in my time. And in a way, it's like being in the army. Or there's a certain machoism with it and whatever. And you seem to be a much more empathetic uh, guy. Maybe, maybe very typical of what a modern manager needs to be. So Alex Ferguson once said to me, he said, Eamon, I couldn't manage in today's era. I wouldn't be allowed to. And he went through various things about the way players and I treated what they expect about uh, uh, well-being, your mental well-being with them. And so basically the whole hairdryer thing just mightn't be allowed or as seemed to be as acceptable um, these, these sort of days. So that talking, how does that transfer then into the heat of the moment on the touchline or in the dressing room or the halftime team talk that you have to be? I mean, is there a hard side to you? 
Uh, d- definitely, yeah, definitely. I have, I have lost it a couple of times. Not often, not often, I will say that. You know, I'll, I'll often try and... Um, I, we, have, we, have such a, we have such a rapport at Wickham. I mean, the boys know, the boys feel like they've let us down sometimes. That, that's, that's big enough for them. It really is. And like you say, in, in this day and age now, um, we have to be aware of so much... Um, and, and I think empathy is a huge word. I've been through, I've been through a, a lot in my life, and, and I, I feel lucky to have been through. It. I mean, the rejections early in the career. Um, I, I, I married and, and got divorced, and, and had a child with someone else that I don't see every day. But, but obviously, we're, we're totally in contact. But sometimes I don't see her on her birthday. Now, these things are major things to people in the world. This is my. But I use all these experiences that I've been through and go right. I, I know what you're feeling because I've been through this. There's a couple of things I haven't been through, of course, some, some major things, but I've been through plenty that I can put myself in my player's position and really empathise with them and think, right, what would I want? If, if I was in this position, what would I want? And I try and, I try and work it out how best to, to get the best out of this guy. And, and so the hairdryer, yeah, it's come up now and again, but it's not, not really, uh, nowhere near like Sir Alex used to do. You know, I, I think that was... That was well documented. This right in your face things. Mine's an almost um, it's not a guilt thing, but they know they haven't performed. They'll know it, and they'll know that I'm disappointed in them. And it's almost like a parent with his, his kid. Your kids know when you're disappointed with them, and that's enough sometimes to uh, to, to get a reaction. To get get a reaction, a vocal response. There's so much I could talk about you. I mean, you've played for so many clubs. Your whole journey getting to where, where you are. Um, now is is incredible. The whole fact that uh, you've had that ten years at Wickham as a, as a player and a manager, there must be a project there. It must be an amazing thing to to see that through and have the the club behind you and do all of that. But you know, so praise and respect for all of that. But I want to bring you back again to your your playing days, Preston North End, right? So you were North Victoria. Uh, John Beck then took you to Preston, and in one match. Um, there was 15 minutes left on the clock and you had to go into goal, right? They had to take you, uh, a player who's conditioned, going forward, attacking, being a, the scourge of goalkeepers, sending crosses in, whatever. And you end up in nets for 15 minutes. Please tell me what that was like as an experience. Uh, honestly, Aaron. The reason I did that is because of who I am. I'll always be the one who volunteers. Anything, when we were young, if there was ever a group of going, who's going to do it first? It was always, I'll do it. It was always, that was me. That was always me. But the so, thing is, if it goes wrong, you're going to get the blame. Why don't you just don't, hang back and say, let somebody else do that? I don't think, I don't think of that. I think this will be a great experience, this will. I remember <laughs> Simon Pond, with the, the goalkeeper came off. And it, again, back in the days of, I think it was one sub. I think this is 92, maybe 93. And it was yeah. one sub or, 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 or two subs. And and I think we'd made them. And, and Simon Farmer, who was the goalkeeper, came off. I think he'd landed awkwardly. And uh, and and John was looking around going, right, who, who? And I think I must have convinced him of a place going, I'll do it. I'll do this. I, I can do this. And that's typical of me. Um, and had you done it before? No. And I, and I wouldn't do it again because I let one in. <laughs> but well, you let it go in. So in that 15 minutes or so, you wait there and you think, do you actually think, oh, please don't let them come up this end? Or are you thinking, I could put on a bit of a show here. I might actually save one of these and I'd be like complete hero. I think, I think you know exactly which one I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> the showman again, the showman again. You then played in a Wembley final. This was the third division playoffs. The year was 1994. What team prevented you from winning? <laughs> the team that I've just taken to the championship, yeah. Wickham Wanderers, um, again, heartbreaking. You know, 21 years old, playing at Wembley. Big occasion, uh, 60,000 plus there. And it was a fantastic day. They were the better side. And it was uh, Mr. Martin O'Neill, who uh, his shadow I will be forever in. But um, he, was, he was brilliant that day and his team was great. And... Simon Garner was uh, was one of the goal scorers for Wickham that day, and he was my absolute boyhood hero. Um, and uh, yeah, I ended up uh, not getting much from the game. I got a yellow card in the game at the end of the game. Where uh, when you got booked back in those days, you got a letter to your house 
So, uh, from the FA. And it's it like was, a letter from your teacher. Yeah, like that. So it was like a letter from the FA saying why you'd been booked, uh, how many points you got. I don't know if you remember that. You got a certain amount of points for each yellow card, two, three, or four, depending yeah. on the severity. And then it said location, where it was. So we were 4-2 down, I think it's about the 92nd minute. And uh, allegedly, I put a late challenge in on a goalkeeper just to get this letter saying, location, Wembley Stadium. And I still may have that letter somewhere today. But, uh, but I, got, I got a tiny something out of Wembley, but uh, not what I wanted, not what we set out to do that day. Amazing. Um, how, how are you feeling now in this close season? Um, do you chill? Do you relax? Do you regroup? Or are you just focused, bearing in mind where you are? It's not like a, a season you've had before. Uh, because it's now the championship. I mean, do you do you do business in the close season? Can you chill? Can you relax? What mood are you in? Yeah, it, it, it's, it is tough to chill and relax. It always is. And uh, you ask any football manager, and I know you've spoken to plenty. The form is just red hot. It really is red hot. There, there seems to be more agents than players out there. You know, honestly, and and some of the players that you get and you WhatsApp text messages, phone calls daily, and Sometimes the biggest worry is missing, missing the, the, the diamond. But I think you've also got to go in your head and go, you know what, stick by what you're thinking. Um, try and use your chill time. I've, I've got a good support team at Wickham. Um, my assistant manager and, and, and the coaching staff, they, they can sometimes take the sessions, leave me in the office to catch up on calls, to catch up on emails. And I, and I have a, a sporting director and, and a CFO who who will do the deals for me. But it's me who picks the players now. It's me who, who looks at the squad and goes, what do we need? Exactly what do we need? And, and there's all sorts of new rules coming in this year. There's going to be salary caps and squad size caps that we've got to adhere to as well. So there's plenty going on. Um, chilling is, chilling is for me, it's family time, it's, it's music. Um, every Monday night, there's a, there's a rehearsal in Watford. We have a studio and sanctuary studios in Watford. And, Every Monday night is about what lyric I'm going to sing next for three hours rather than who's the next signing coming in. And that, that's chill time for me. Um, but I, I do, I don't, this isn't everything to me. Football is not everything. And, and I think that's really important that I, I keep it that way. It's, I have other things. Yeah. You, know. you say that, you say that, but it may not be everything to you. But the more success you have, the more you're noted um, in the championship the more other teams will, will look at you, the more you will be on the radar of, of other clubs and things. So sometimes these things are taken out of, out of your hands. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could end for you at uh, Wickham because of them. It could end at Wickham because of you. Uh, but, but things aren't going to be the same, really, from, from here on in. What, what would you like to say on behalf of lower leagues and lower league managers in, in general? Because a lot of you would be invisible, you know, to people who are just totally into the Premier League and whatever. And yet look at the business, look at the passion, look at the enthusiasm that takes place there. Look at the base of fans that yeah. are supporting so many teams. What, what, what would you like to say on behalf of the lower leagues and lower league managers? Just the total respect, I mean, for some of those guys down there who've been at these clubs. It's really tough. It is really tough. And I know... People will say that oh, it's just because you're in League Two and because it's really, really tough um, to try and make that money go as far as when you've got teams just coming over the top of you all the time and outdoing you with, with signings and loan signings. And I think these rules slightly will favour the smaller clubs now because people can't hoard now 30 players and things like that. But it's, it's really tough. And, and you have people like John Coleman at Accrington who, who works wonders year after year you know, with, with, with what he does with, uh, with that team. Um, I would, I would really love um, some of these top managers uh, to go and have a go at it, you know, because it's not it's a different ball game. <laughs> excuse the pun, you know, it really is. And I, I've always looked at the Championship and the Premier League as almost it's, it's a different sport sometimes because it's it's so far away from leagues two and leagues one. We're so we're so grateful and so. So fortunate, we've worked so hard, it's paid off and we've finally got there but by chance, by luck, by hard work, deserved, whatever people think. But I'll never, ever forget that that bottom two divisions where things can be so, so tough, honestly. Um, and, and really, the managers go through st stressful times. More, they haven't got the resources that 
you can't delegate to a sports psychologist. You can't you can't get ring the grounds up and say, I need that pitch looking perfect tomorrow. And that's you have to do these yourself sometimes. You really do. And uh, and at Wickham in the first few years, I was everything. I was everything. I was psychologist, groundsman, and I still I'm probably the only manager in the championship who knows the the workings of an actual sprinkler system, which I could go and fix if it breaks down because I've had to do it, you know. So it's it's um I bet you Jose Mourinho doesn't have to do that. Well, maybe, maybe not. But I don't wanna I don't want to say what people can and can't do. I know what I can do and I could do that. <laughs> the back of a tractor fixing a, you know I, I, and still to this day, we had a we had to put a lock on one of the doors the other day. And I knew that if I if I rang down the stadium, it would take a couple of days. So I, I just went to the local shop, bought a little lock, took my drill in the other day and put it on. And I thought, why not? Why not? Respect. You know, respect. respect. Yeah. No job too small. No um, it is an amazing job you have ahead of you. Um, you've got Brentford and the Caribou Cup coming up, and then you've got Rotherham, uh, and your league uh, campaign gets underway. Uh, for those that haven't heard of you, Gareth Ainsworth, I think they will remember you. I think you are a, a new man, a new name uh, on the radar for so many football fans. Thank you for taking time to talk to me about being a gaffer and all that involves, including sprinkler systems and putting locks on doors. As a gaffer, final word to you. How would you like to be described? I mean, when you you know when you're there on the scene and the championship matches are being televised and people are saying, "Oh, who's the blo- who's the trendy bloke with the long hair?" There, I haven't seen him before. How would you how would you like people to remember you, know you as? How would you describe yourself? Do you know what? I mean, if people can look back and go, you know, um, I learned a little bit, uh, maybe not about football, but I, I learned something whether it was life or football. And he was true to himself, and and that would be that be a nice way to be to be remembered. Success is is always judged and, and recorded in the history books. But sometimes, to, somebody said to me once, uh, and it's nice when you hear it. He said, "Ah, oh, best manager I played for, Gaffer." That meant so much to me. It meant so much to me. And he said it. Uh, he might be. He might have said it to get a new contract, but it meant <laughs> so much to me. Uh, and, uh, and little words like that, little things like that, when you, you know you've made a difference in someone's life, that means yeah. the world. So, true to myself, a little bit different, but um, you learn a little bit from me. That'd be great. Well, Gareth Ainsworth, may you go round and round and round and round and da da da. You're the kind of guy I like to talk to. Thank you very much. Every success. He's at Wickham, he's the gaffer there. He is. Gareth Ainsworth, thank you very much indeed. You can listen and you can see this video cast and, and our podcast from all your usual outlets and uh, the video cast is there on YouTube. Please do spread the word. Gareth, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.